We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere. It's Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Well, the best way for questions to come through us is through the website. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. And I got to say, this seems to be working because I have been getting questions asked in like the comment sections of other people's posts now. So I'm, I'm totally cool with that. I want to be known as the guy that people ask questions. So that came up the other day. Like someone was just like, hey, I am looking for a cheap miniature game with fantasy miniatures in it. And I'm like, okay, are you just looking for the miniatures or are you looking for a game? They're like, no, no, I just want a bunch of miniatures cheap. And I've been told buying board games is better than like going and buying Warhammer, right? So I'm like, oh, fair enough. Rune Wars <laughs> is like $26 on flipping Walmart right now. And it's a $100 game. So head right over there. So, and that was like in a thread about something completely other side. They're like, oh, so Mo. <laughs> Heck, Phil Vicione pulled that one yesterday or the last week in the, in the, um, in the middle of doing their podcast recording, he's like, wait, Mo, what was that game? Yeah. Which I thought was pretty good. And then yep. uh, Chris Nisak was pointing out that one of, was he like the computer for you? You just like, <laughs> Mo, can you answer this question about board games? I'm all good for that. I, I, I like it. I want that to keep continuing. And I got to admit, I'm no longer having to beg for questions. We're, we've got a, we got a nice build up again, which is awesome. And if I don't get to your question, I do apologize. It, we may get to it eventually. Some questions fit better than others. There's lots of things that make us decide. If you really want your question answered, just plug me again. Say, hey, I asked this a while ago and you never got back to me, and I'll see if I can bump it up the list. All right. Uh, so far, 2020 has sucked for me. I have spent most of 2020 with my new close buddy, Streptococcus A, dealing with not one but two bouts of strep throat. Uh, it started to the night before uh, New Year's Eve in 2019, and I don't know if you can hear it in my voice, but I am still fighting it to this day and still taking pills for it, even right now. So it has been terrible. Um, strep throat's pretty horrible. Uh, the way I was describing it is I think my Adam's apple was replaced by a spiky ball of obsidian because every time I swallowed, it just felt like it was tearing me apart. It was really a not fun. Now, one of the unfortunate side effects of this, uh, other than shit, oh, terrible pain, has been that it's affected my regular gaming group. Uh, as well as some of the local gaming events here in Windsor. And I've had to cancel some pretty big events. Um, so I thought today an appropriate topic for the show would be to talk about what do you do when someone has to bail on game night? When one or more of the players can't make it, uh, whether it's for illness, doesn't have to be strep throat, but for whatever reason it is. Oh. Now, first, oh, yeah. go ahead. No, nope, no, nope, sorry. Uh, first off, I want to say canceling anything sucks. Like, it really does, for especially the other people that you're gaming with, not necessarily for you. Just try not to do it, if at all possible. Um, I realize some people are of the opinion it's only gaming, but gaming can be a very important aspect of many people's lives. And I'm not just talking about people like, oh, their head's in the crowd escapism. No, it's important. It's a, it's a thing. Personally, I, I like to think of having a regular game night or a regular game group as being like being on a sports team or as important on that. If you fail to show up for the game, you're letting down not just yourself, but the entire team. Yep. It's only gaming. It's only a family dinner. It's just one vote. Little <laughs> things can have big effects. Don't underestimate the power of social shared social experiences. Now, one aspect of this comes up when you've actually signed up to play a game. Like, like, think about it beforehand. Like, before the first game night, when you commit to going to a game night, to showing up, whether that's you're going to play one game on Saturday or whether it's I'm going to be there every two weeks or I'm, we're going to meet once a month, whatever the, the, the commitment is, make sure you can actually commit to it. Yeah, sure, I'll be there. When you're actually thinking, you know, this would be kind of neat to do if I can make it, that's not cool. If you can't commit, be honest about it. I'd love to play, but I don't know if I can make it or I, I'll try to make it, but I might not be able to is way better than saying, yeah, yeah, no problem. I'll be there. And then not showing up. Yeah. Only commit to a level you're comfortable with. If a group demands a weekly session and you're not sure that's possible, don't say you will expecting, oh, they'll be fine if I take a week off now and then. No, they really won't. Yeah. Uh, and it's rude of you to expect them to. 
uh, booking a game night is a commitment. Try to stick to it. Now, to the flip side of that, realize things happen. Unexpected obligations come up, especially with family and work. People get sick, cars break down. There are any number of very valid reasons for someone to cancel on game night. And that's not necessarily a reason to jump on the person. No matter how good your group is or how loyal and regular your players are, at some point, someone's going to have to cancel. Absolutely. A wheel falling off your car. Sickness. You can't plan for these. Your child's swimming lessons, a monthly third Friday of the month dinner with your in-laws. These are things that can be and should be planned for in advance. Yes, exactly. The other thing, too, is if you do find you have to break out on a gaming obligation, be sure to let everyone know. Let the entire group know as soon as possible. Even if you just got a heads up that you might need to cancel, let everyone know then. Like, oh, you know what? I just found out my mother-in-law is going to be in town. We're probably not going to have dinner till Saturday. But just in case, you know, I might not be able to make it Friday. I just wanted to let you guys know. Let people know. Basically, over-communicate. The more heads up you give people, the better chance they can actually salvage that night and plan to do something else or play something else. And now this is more important, the larger the group is and the further anyone in it might have to travel yeah. to take part. Very true. So the inevitable happens. Someone cancels. What next? One of the big things that's going to affect this particular topic, and my answer to this is whether or not your game group is uh, a standard board game night where you're just going to get together and play board games or an RPG night. Or if it is a board game night, if whether it's some kind of legacy or campaign game. I, I guess the important thing is, do you need to have the same players present each week, each session or not? As we've seen, some games like Gloomhaven in particular have built-in options for this sort of eventuality. And you can do solo games, random dungeons, or even alternate parties. But if you're playing an RPG campaign and your wizard is sick on the night you're supposed to assault the orc keep, that might be an issue. All right, let's start off where the game group where it doesn't really matter if the same people are there each week. And you're not playing any type of ongoing game. And I guess in most cases, this isn't a big deal. This, this is usually a pretty easy fix. The players who didn't cancel still show up and they play something. In many cases, this can still be the same game, especially with board games. Uh, there are very few games out there that are like, I can only play with player X. We only play with three players. If we don't have three players, we can't play. Most games have a range. And yeah, sure, some are better at certain player points. But most board games have a range. And the host will most likely have other options. So if you were planning on playing this game that is best at five and you've been wanting to get it to the table with five players for months, just play a different game. Play, you know, because there's probably another game out there and odds are good that whoever's hosting or, or you know, uh, organizing the event doesn't only have games that only play five players. <laughs> that would be really hard to manage. I'm, I'm sure we could come up with something if we tried, but that's a lot of effort. So I am I am the four player game only. I only play four player games. I have a collection of 700 games that only play four yeah, players. Exactly. But yeah, it, it, even though there's games of different player counts, if that's a problem, pick something else to play, right? Now I admit this could suck. If you plan to play something specific, especially if the cancellation is last minute and you've done prep work, right? That's where that's where it, 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 it's terrible. Like if that's a board game and you went and you sat up the board and you put out all the player pieces and you shuffled the decks already and had everything ready to play, that kind of stinks. Uh, even if you had an RPG, right? And you planned out your adventure for the whole weekend and you spent 16 hours in the last week doing prep work and you're all ready to run the game and then you can't, really... Yeah, it sucks, and it's going to be frustrating, but really all you're losing is some time. Plus, especially in the RPG section, or if, say, you studied before a board game, reread the rulebook and watched some Watch It Play videos, any of that prep's still there. It's still in your head. Uh, any scenario building you did or rule revising or rule revision is still going to be there next week. So you just lost a bit of time. It's not that big a deal. Now, what I like to do when we can't play the game we were supposed to play is do something completely different. Break from the routine and give your social group, give your group, give your players, give your group of friends a break from what they usually do. Like if you usually play heavy strategy games, try something light. If you usually play light games, try something heavier. 
pull out your food chain magnet. Go to the host's house and say, hey, what's the game that's been on the pile of shame the longest? And play that, whatever it is. Try a one-shot RPG. Or if you're used to running a fantasy game, play a cyberpunk game the next session. Yep. Lasers and feelings, powers and punches, tights and fights. There are a huge <laughs> number of quick RPG one-shot options out there if your group's willing to just grab something, a one-sheet, and improvise. Now, the biggest problem, of course, is if you have that ongoing campaign, right? The game where you need the same players. And what you do is very much going to depend on your personal group and, in particular, the game you're playing. Now, starting off with campaign-style games, you probably have some few, a few options. Like Sean mentioned earlier, Gloomhaven or in Imperial Assault, there are options out there. And in both those games, you can actually just play a character short. You're just the, the game is designed to be played with up to four players. You can play with three. The scenario is adjust. The problem there, though, is the absent player may feel like they missed out on something. So be sure to talk to them and see if they're cool with you continuing the game without them. Now, this has come up multiple times with our personal Groomhaven group, which we stream on Friday nights on Twitch, twitch.tv slash tabletop bellop. And the answer for us was to do casual gameplay in Gloomhaven, which meant either redoing missions we'd already done just to see if we get some more gold or XP or to get a treasure we missed or playing through random dungeons. We had a lot of fun playing random dungeons. And then once coming back from Origins, we picked up the solo quest book for Gloomhaven. And that's what we've been doing lately is letting everyone run through their solo quests. Now, this totally depends on the game. Some games are going to have this. Some games are not. Now, I think moving forwards, personally, when possible, more games will likely have options having seen the success of Gloomhaven and, and others like this uh, and being able to keep that game at the table, right? Because if, if a publisher can keep a game on the table, that means they're going to keep selling expansions and they're going to keep making mm -hmm. money off of it. So, I mean, in some ways, Gloomhaven has ha made a really smart move, making sure that if you were a player short or if you mm -hmm. were two players short, you could still keep playing that game. Yeah. Because like technically you can play solo. Yeah. Uh, because, I mean, we'll talk about some things that happen later when yeah. things break down and cancellations happen more regularly. Yeah. Now, the other thing you see, like we were mentioning, Gloomhaven has alternate ways to play it. Besides just having like the, the um, random dungeon games like Imperial Assault. Imperial Assault's a good example here because it has the campaign mode, but it also has a cooperative mode using an app. Or there's a miniature battle skirmish mode. And all of those are good ways to still play Imperial Assault without continuing your campaign. But at least your group still gets to get together and still play some Imperial Assault. And maybe you learn something that's going to be able, you'll be able to bring back to your main campaign. Now, if this isn't an option for your game of choice, you may need to look at playing something else or just canceling the game night overall. Now, my personal feelings, and I, I think most people probably agree with me on this, I lean very strongly on the play something else side of things, at least get together. While I know that everyone would rather be playing the main game, what, you, what, what you're supposed to be playing, I'd rather get everyone together and play something than totally cancel the week. And the reason for that is wanting to keep a feeling of continuity. You want to meet every week. You want people to get used to meeting every week or every month or whatever your time frame is. If you keep canceling week in and week out due to one player or another, eventually you're not going to have that weekly group or monthly group. People aren't going to set the time aside for it. And when that absent player finally makes it back and shows up, one of your regulars is going to be like, oh, I made plans because we haven't played in months. I didn't think we'd be playing this week. Trust me, I have seen this happen with my own groups many times. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's all too easy for other players when one is canceled to use that as an excuse for themselves to cancel. Oh, yeah. well, if Joe can't make it, I could really use the time to do something. I, trust me, I'm sure many of us have done it. Yeah, you want to try to keep the consistency, right? Like, the we are going to do something. And I think I mentioned this later, but it was more about RPGs. But even if that something isn't necessarily playing a game, at least get together just to keep that time slot booked. Now, jumping over to the RPG side of things, and you actually have a lot more options because one of the great things about RPGs is their versatility. And an RPG, the GM, DM, Hollyhock God, whatever you want to call them, can literally make anything happen. The trick is keeping all the players interested and happy, including the ones that happen to be absent. So I know we talked about taking down the Star Destroyer tonight, 
but the Republic has informed you that the Imperial timetable has been altered and the ship will not be at the rendezvous point when expected. Instead, we've got this smuggler problem over here. Yeah, easy to do. Like, honestly, it really is. Now, some possible options are to continue the campaign without the absent player or players. This is something. Um, this is the same problem with the board game and continuing your Gloomhaven campaign without a player is the missing person may feel they missed out on something. But it can be the best option with an ongoing game with a very structured plot or something that's time limited. Like, for example, Shadows of the Demon Lord is designed to only play X number of sessions. So anything with those kind of time limits. You don't get those in a lot of games, but some games have them. Or if you're like, we are playing this game seven sessions and that it, and we're moving on to something else for whatever obligation, whether it's you promised another DM or whatever it is, you don't want to lose one of those weeks. Sure, it'll be tougher to fight the Goblin Army without your healer. Think how much more XP everyone will get with one less player. I don't think there's any RPG that's come out since the year 2000 <laughs> where you still divide XP by player, but maybe. <laughs> there's enough old school gamers out there still yep. playing with it. Uh, the trick here, of course, though, is what do you do with the character, right? The, the, the player is missing. Everyone knows that. What do you do with that character? And this is something you will probably find at least one podcast episode from every RPG podcast that's ever been written. You're going to find a million blog posts on. This is a big topic of discussion. With all the new people getting into D&D &D due to Critical Role and the 5th edition rules, I keep seeing these topics come back up, and it has for as long as I've been gaming. Um, the easiest, the, the, the basic... One is the character's there, but they fade into the background. It's assumed they're doing their thing, but they just didn't have a huge impact on the plot. And well, nothing in the plot had a huge impact on them. Yeah, they're they're out in the back with the wagon train. Didn't you see them? They're they're covering the rear of the convoy. Oh, that's, that's it. But remember, I said there were eighteen goblins there. Well, there was actually twenty three, and Sean's character took down those last five. Right? It's easy enough to do. Now, some groups like to have another player take over the character and play two. I personally have never been a fan of controlling more than one character in a role-playing game. I'm not a big fan of that. But you know what? In a board game with a campaign, like, I, sure, Imperial Assault, I'll control someone else's character. Yeah, no, absolutely. Many co-op games especially have rules for playing multiple characters at lower player counts. So no reason not to go with that to cover a missing player if possible. Now, my personal favorite way to handle this, because I like verisimilitude in my games. I like to, I like things that are happening in the metagame to make sense in the narrative. Something I've always been a big fan of is to find an in-game reason for that character to not be present. Uh, this works particularly well if the player absence is known well in advance and can even be part of the plot of the game. So the example I'm going to pull up here is I, I love 4th edition D&D. &D. We probably lost some subscribers for that, <laughs> but I really liked it. I ran a ton of 4th edition D&D, &D, both organized play and a home game. In my home game, uh, I live in Windsor, Ontario, Canada, an automotive city. There is someone in our chat room right here who is not here every two weeks because he works shift work. That is what was happening in my game group. I had Mike Barker and another guy, Dan, in my group, and they worked opposite shifts. So in we were playing Keep on the Shadowfell, which is the first adventure in 4th Ed D&D &D if you're doing the whole Orcus plot, the whole you go from level 1 all the way to level 30 if you follow these books. And the group failed. That the, the end of the plot in the first adventure is a portal that the Shadowfell was opened up and all of a sudden the Shadowfell spilling into reality. I took that right away and went, wow, this is simple. So every two weeks, a rift in the Shadowfell opens up and Mike Barker is suddenly in the Shadowfell. And well, out comes Dan's character out from the Shadowfell every two weeks. And that way, we always had the same number of players. Everyone was always there. And it became an in-game thing. Like it was uh, an actual thing the players were trying to solve which I, I don't think some of the characters got the metal plot of you're never going to solve this as long as they're working shift work. <laughs> but like it all made sense in game. Like I, I had players that I knew well ahead of time. They're going to be here. Or they're not. And well, that's when they're trapped in the shadow fell. And now I'll admit I did some cool stuff so that the players didn't miss out on stuff where like if they came back, they could tell me a story of what they did in the shadow fell. And if they told a compelling enough story, they would get the XP the rest of the group got. So we had this whole thing where the, those Dan and Mike were coming up with this whole story of what was going on the other side of the world, which I thought was really cool. But that's a way to work it into the game. Yeah. And also, you can integrate some things like leveling mechanics. If you've uh, if, there, if there's a mechanic built into your game where, you know, leveling up requires some effort, well, they went back to work with their master, study with their master yep. in their hometown and couldn't be here for that reason. But when they're back, they'll be a level nine paladin instead, you know, or whatever. 
Yeah, I personally think that the whole you weren't here, you don't get XP is very old school grognardy way to think and you shouldn't punish people for not being able to show up. Unless the person has come up with BS excuses for not showing up, but then you should just have the adult conversation and tell them to leave the group. I, I, I don't believe in penalizing people for not showing up for valid reasons. And I actually don't believe in penalizing people for not showing up for not valid reasons. I just believe in don't game with that person anymore. All right. What about when you don't want to continue the main game, right? You don't want to continue the plot because something important is about to happen. You need all the players there, whatever it happens to be. Um, you really want to keep the group together. Uh, I basically mentioned this above. You still want to meet up and you actually want to game, right? Keep the schedule. You don't want to keep canceling the entire game night. So what do you do? One option that I like is to play the same characters and play through something that doesn't impact the main story whether it's a side quest or even cooler more modern gaming uh, storyteller game play a flashback play something when, when all your characters were kids and they first met or do a total aside a similar rather fun option to play this is something i first saw recommended by robin laws was play in the same campaign world but play a different group of characters and one of the neater ones is make them players play their enemies play the bad guys play on the other side now, this is a great way to flesh out and experience more of your game world, to, to share that world from a different character's point of view, still getting the group to play in that same world, still having the experience, while not playing something else. I mean, you could even do something as interesting as playing bad guys and in from a third-party view, scoping out where your good guys are yeah. actually going to end up fighting in a week or so but you're actually seeing the bad guy's view of their own, you know, their own lair or their own exactly. cave or something like that. Uh, and, you know, you don't need to talk about it, but all of a sudden, two weeks later, the players walk in and go, hey, wait a second. <laughs> I recognize this. That is what we call dramatic irony. <laughs> yeah, I've actually had it where I had players plan, plant the traps for their own characters once where they, the, the one group, the group of players planned the defense of a castle, and then the same group of characters raided that castle and hated themselves for it <laughs> when they got to that point. Uh, now, there's another way. Be able to stick to your regular game, but not play. Like, you're going to play. So this is to do something for your regular game that isn't play the game. Like, I, I'm fumbling on my English here. Now, like, like here, here's an example. So this is the week you guys all get together and you work on your heraldry or you all do character drawings, or you decide to map out your home base, or everyone decides, like fourth ed D&D, one of the things that some people really hated about the game is you could make a wish list for magic items. And I actually really like that system. I know over similitude, it's terrible, but you know what? I like metagaming. It was a great tactical game and players having the right equipment was very important. So this would be the week. You know what? Tom can't make it. We're all going to sit down. Everyone's going to revise the magic item wish list to make sure they're up to date. Or you're going to sit there and you're playing 3.5, a, a, a F20 game. You're going to plan out your next six character levels and all the feats you're going to take. I know this is something Sean used to love. He used to love planning out his stuff ahead of time. It's the metagame stuff, right? The stuff that's like cool to do that you sometimes do as lonely fun, but it's the kind of stuff you normally wouldn't do and interrupt the game for, but it'd be cool to have. Yeah. Personally, I will never turn down a chance to do long-term character arc or planning <laughs> Uh, on our, you know, back when we first started playing and we were doing weekend Saturdays, Saturdays at the university, uh, we'd show up at whatever time, but the rest of the group wouldn't necessarily all have a fixed time for showing up. And if I had a couple of hours to kill, yeah, I would work on heraldry or mm -hmm. plan out character advancement, or uh, I've had characters who had who ran a casino and we worked out the, you know, the math for what that kind of income was going to be over the month and, and you know, what the layout of the casino was. And that's all. There's a lot of stuff that you can do that isn't advancing the campaign, but is still advancing characters and advancing the world in general. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. I mean, I used to play Traveler on the computer for the character creation. Couldn't <laughs> stand the game. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, that goes way back. Same thing with the actual. No, actually I actually like the RPG. I, I we used to make Deanna and I used to make characters, Traveler characters at the Bridge Tavern. Um, the other obvious answer, of course, is play another game. Right. Um, I mentioned this when talking about board games. What I like to do is take a break. So I, I want whatever we play instead to be as far away as possible from what we're currently playing. Uh, with RPGs, obviously, the options are play board games, right? Um, play a one-shot. Make characters for another system. 
I always try to make this very divergent, right? Like if I'm playing fantasy for my main game, let's play some cyberpunk one shots, right? Now there is a risk to this. One that my home group, uh, especially my older home, the, the group that, that I played with for years knows way too well. And that is the squirrel effect of getting distracted by whatever that new game is you played. Um, I don't know how many of my early campaigns ended because someone couldn't make it one week. So then we played something else and then everyone had so much fun playing that something else. We never went back to the original game. Now, unfortunately, Deanna is not in our chat room today due to uh, unforeseen circumstances. But if she was in there, she would be screaming in capital letters. Yes, yes, yes. I hate that. Basically, uh, there were so many games over the years. We're playing a Dragonlance campaign. Oh, the, the Al can't make it. OK, let's let's play some cyberpunk. You know what? Let's play cops in cyberpunk. That'll be unique. And then I ran Cyberpunk for eight months. And then at some point, someone's like, oh, uh, we can't make it. And let's play something horror. I'm like, oh, I, I got this chill game from Mayfair. Yeah, and then we played that for six months. And we never went back to that original game. Yeah, well, sadly, there's no real way around this other than just trying to keep everyone on the same page and, and managing expectations. Yeah. Now, I'll admit, we were all really bad at the whole sitting down and actually discussing what we all wanted to do in a group. I don't know. I don't know why. Like, I'm sure this goes back to the 70s and guy gags where you just never really thought to say, hey, what do we all want to do? It was just always like the DM's going to going to lead the charge and everyone's going to follow or they're not because they don't want to play anymore. There was never that. I don't know. We never had the like, yeah, now and then be like, what do you want to play next? But it was just never the 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 session zeros that we talk about nowadays. And I think that's a big part of it. Like now you want to set that explanation. Like, yeah, yeah, we're going to play Cyberpunk, but it's only this week and we're going to jump back. And if they get to that point where someone doesn't want to jump back to another system, then you should be talking about, whoa, wait, why don't we want to jump back? What happened to that campaign? Do we want to end that campaign and have that conversation? Um, now, the important thing overall, this is this is going back to overall tabletop gaming, LARPing, whatever type of gaming you do. Um, have a plan in place, have that conversation. Basically, uh, I, I segue better than I thought to my own show notes, uh, perfectly, be preferably before absenteeism becomes a problem, but even better before the game starts, the campaign starts, the, the RPG campaign, the, the, we're going to get together every Saturday before that even really starts, before you have that first session, you need to sit down and have an open, honest conversation about what you're going to do. What What is the social contract? What do you do when someone doesn't show up? What do you do when two people don't show up? What causes you to say, you know what, game night's off. We can't play at all. And what's the backup plan what, when you can't play your main game or when you do have to cancel the night? Yeah, uh, well, we've got one pa uh, patrons group plan that they have in place that covers almost all eventualities. And we'll talk about that when we get to the lobby after the main section. Cool. I look forward to that. Uh, now, like I said, this is part of the social contract with your group. And no, by calling it a contract, I don't necessarily mean it needs to be a legal document or like something written down. But you know what? Some groups do write this stuff down. Uh, there was an RPG podcast out there. Uh, Sean and I were both diving, looking for this particular one that had a great one you could download. I couldn't find that. I did find some alternatives. Uh, if we do find the one I was looking for, or a good one, we'll throw them in the show notes. We found some pretty good ones. But there are there's a reason to put it down. Yeah, no, absolutely. There uh, are a few of them out there, and many people have broached this topic. Uh, just Google uh, RPG so social contract or gaming social yeah. contract, and and the uh, the list goes on and on and on and on. Yeah. Now, I'm sure there's some of you out there that are shaking your head at the thought of writing this stuff down. But you know what? One of the things this does is indicate to everyone, to everyone in the group, how serious this is. As I said at the start of this, at the very top, you're signing up to play a game. That is you signing up for an obligation. You are now committed. It's just as important as an obligation, say your kids' hockey practice or your dinner plans with your mom. It's just as important. You are obligated to do this. And by putting it down on paper and putting down these social rules and these gaming table rules, these unwritten rules, make them written, just drives home how important the group is going to take that thing. Absolutely. And for some of us, probably more important than dinner with the relatives, but I digress. <laughs> Possibly. That's it too. Like the gaming should be as important. So when your mom calls up and says, no, I want to do this. Like, no, sorry, that's game night. It just is, right? And, and it's part of uh, gaming has become much more socially acceptable than it was back in the day. But it used to drive me nuts at, at my work, right? Uh, previous employees. 
I would be like, look, I need Friday night off because I am hosting a game night at the CG Realm. I can't work overtime that night. And they'd be like, no, no, we need you here. And then someone else would follow me in and go, no, no, I got hockey that night. I can't do it. And they'd be like, oh, yeah, you got hockey. And that was perfectly fine. I'm like, come on. It's the same thing. I'm letting down a team. Maybe I'm not flicking a puck, but that used to frustrate me a lot. I don't know how that changed now that I work from home and I don't work in the auto industry anymore. Maybe that's not as common as it was, but I, my guess is it probably is. Gaming is just as important as any other social obligation you have. Now, there is one final part of this topic I want to cover, something that's come up far too often for me personally in the last few weeks due to this damn strep throat, and that is what to do if the person has to cancel is the host or the organizer, the, 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 the person running things. This is really... The, the worst possible scenario, and one that you got to try to avoid as much as possible. In this case, most of what I said at the top is just as, if not more important. Make sure you're honest, only cancel for good reason, and be sure to communicate. And communicate as soon as you know there's a risk to the game night. Now, ideally, as we'll, we'll touch on later on, have a backup person. This is actually only a worst case scenario if your entire game strategy yeah. relies on one person to host and facilitate. If you have redundancies in place, this might just be another gaming night. Very true, very true. Now, if at all possible, you wanna have the game night go on. I've mentioned this multiple times. You don't wanna cancel the, the entire thing. You don't wanna call it off. You wanna have people get together to get that regularity and knowing that, hey, every Monday we're gaming, every Monday. Um, I know a few times, though, not often, I've had people in my house, gaming in my house, while I was sick upstairs in bed, or I was working an unplanned overtime shift because, you know, they gave the guy who had hockey games the night off, and I had to cover them. Um, if that, So people are at my house gaming, because that's where we game. That's where the games are. I've got the big game room. i got the big game table. So they're gaming without me. If that's not possible, the rest of the group should still try to get together. Maybe you play at another player's house or you go to a coffee shop or a gaming cafe or a local game store. Even if you can't find a venue, I personally still think it's worth getting the gang together, even if it's just to hang out, share a meal, uh, just to keep that regular schedule going. Maybe this is a great chance for everyone to go out, get a drink and talk about the ongoing game. A check-in, is everyone still having fun? Are you guys having fun playing D&D? &D? Maybe brainstorm. What, what should we do next? What, what game, you know what? We're going to finish this game in six weeks. What should we do next? What Gloomhaven scenario do you want to do next? Hey, what do you want to do with your character? What are you trying to, you trying to get money? Whatever. Or maybe just sit and BS and tell, tell stories, especially in a, in a role-playing game. If you have a regular group that's been playing together for any amount of time, just sitting around and talking about, hey, remember when we were level two and this happened? can be a great way to spend a night. Yep. Heck, if the DM can't make a session of an RPG, the players can still plot, plan, and organize. They might even find some flaws in their strategy and work on a new plan, maybe a more efficient deployment in combat or something. But when you're entirely focused on that game content, you might never have come across. Uh, I know uh, on my online Masks RPG, uh, we play on Discord, and sometimes the DM's not logged in, but a bunch of players are there and want to chat, there's still lots of things you can do. You just have to avoid any of those, you know, world changing, we need a dice roll moments mm -hmm. and you can still get things done. Now for any hosted event, uh, absenteeism, right? You're hosting the event. You're, you're the one that has to be there, right? This is basically what Sean had said. You want to try to find someone to cover you. Uh, again, if you can plan this ahead of time, great. If you don't, uh, you want to try to ask friends and family, right? I did this for the last CG Realm game night. As everyone knows on this, I run game nights fairly regularly at the CG Realm, or at least help them run game nights, depending on who's running what and who's doing the demos. I was supposed to be doing demos of Carpe Diem, a Steppenfeld game I'm really digging, but there was no way I could go to that with the strep throat. Plus, like, besides the fact I couldn't talk at that time and I like, had a fever, I didn't want to spread this horrible plague to anyone else. So I asked Deanna if she would mind going to the event without me, and she played teacher and host for that event. As far as I know, it went well. I didn't hear any complaints. It seemed to go well enough. Similar situation happens when the DM is sick for an RPG session, right? It's pretty hard to continue the game without the moderator or whatever that role in games that need that. In this case, my previous advice of playing something else works, or finding something meta you can do, like Sean suggested. But there's sometimes another option, which is to find someone to cover you as host and that's 
getting another player to cover you as GM. Now, this works best when you're playing a very scripted plot and is something I personally done through organized play in Dungeons & Dragons. I both had DMs cover me, and I've run for other DMs who couldn't make it with literally half an hour, 10 minutes notice. Usually this isn't a problem, because most organized play events are, uh, to be honest, on rails, right? They're very scripted. Uh, they don't require the DM to really know what happened prior to the group getting together or really care what happens after. It's just a matter of running that module then. Now, this can also work in a home game, especially when playing pre-written modules, which is something that I find seems to be becoming more and more popular especially with new people getting into it. Uh, people play through the uh, Pathfinder Adventure Pass, and people are playing, I think, Descent to Avernus is the big D&D &D one that's going on now. Um, so when you have that script to think it's possible, another GM could just take it over. Now, you may not want that to be one of the players to not spoil things and everything else. You might have to find someone outside. But it's also possible, it, it, depending on the group you have, where you have no secrets and you're just more about the, the game and telling a story, it's not going to matter that Sean knows that the goblin boss happens to be in hex C12. It's not going to ruin anything. Now, the worst possible answer, and the one that may be inevitable, though, is that you just have to cancel. Now, the important thing here is to let everyone know what's next. Now that you've had to cancel, let everyone know if the, if the group still stands or if this is a temporary set setback. And everything's going to be back on schedule. Like, hey, I, I've been sick. I'll get back to it. I'm sorry. I'll run the next event. It's all good. Or if it's a less regular group, at least let people know the, the, the event, the demo game will be rescheduled. So like, hey, we're going to play Twilight Imperium two Saturdays from now. It's like, oh, sorry, we can't make it. But you know what? We'll try next month. But if it's a weekly thing, it's just, hey, you know what? No, it's just one week. We'll be back. Now, if you know exactly when you're going to reschedule, great. But if not, let people know that you're planning on it. Like, that's basically what's going to happen with the big birthday party. I was going to have a bunch of people over gaming. We'll probably do that sometime here in January, but until I'm 100%, I don't know when that's going to happen. But we do plan on doing something. And, of course, sometimes even rescheduling is impossible, and you got to give up. This is most likely to happen if the absence is going to be long-term or recurring, whether planned or not. Now, ending a game night and breaking up a group is probably a big enough topic for another full show. Now, the important thing, though, is something we've talked about many times tonight, and that is communicate. Make sure everyone's on the same page and move forward once everyone agrees on what to do next. Absolutely. Now, I think before we jump into the lobby, we're going to talk about uh, this other option and uh, the, the plan that Jeff has uh, had made available to us on what their group does. Uh, and this came from the Discord. So Jeff uh, has written, they have frequent cancellations and they developed a rhythm for ensuring their game nights happen regardless. With the following simple guidelines, they can avoid almost all game night cancellations with six players. If at least nice. three of us can show up and one is a GM, they play. Now, they have a secondary GM with a backup game to play if the primary GM is away, and they were mentioning in the chat room that sometimes that secondary game is the same game, uh, huh. so it's the same system, so you're just yep. literally hopping characters. Now, well, that's what we were talking about. Yeah. Where you're you're playing in the same world, right? Yeah. You're gonna get you're gonna dive deeper and see more of the lore in the world by seeing everything from a different set of characters' eyes. Yeah. Now they have two or more people willing to host, so they can yeah. still play if one host is unavailable. And they also have a favorite cafe to play at if both <laughs> hosts are unavailable, which is rare. Nice. Now, they play games that lend themselves to PCs being missing, and now that's important. So you want to mm -hmm. make sure that you're not locking yourself into. Uh, something where you need to have your paladin, your magic user, uh, your your you know, or whatever available all mm -hmm. at the same time, where you can't get through the magic portal. <laughs> uh, yep. uh, they embrace a mode of play that doesn't require RPing chronologically through everything the PCs do every day. Jump cut to a new scene, and don't worry about explaining why Grog the Barbarian isn't still standing six feet to the left of the doorway where he was last week. Yeah, that's a definitely a modern view of gaming. And I got to admit, when I first got into the Forge and was talking to Nathan D. Paoletta, forced scening was just foreign to me. <laughs> like, I, I don't know what it was. It's, I think it's because RPGs, when we grew up, came out of war gaming. Yep. And they, 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 everyone was trying for simulationists, which makes no sense when you got flipping elves and dragons. <laughs> but we wanted to care that, whoa, wait a minute, he was there. What do you, and like, what do you do for the two weeks you're in town? How many times back in the day... All right, what'd you do the next day? 
Yep. All right, what'd you do the next day? Hold on, I gotta roll to see if anything random happened. Oh yeah, what'd you do that? Like, why? Why did we do that? <laughs> we just didn't know better, right? Yep. Uh, so they tend to play episodic games that expect everyone to be back at HQ yeah. for the beginning of each section, like a West Marches style D and D campaign or Blades in the Dark. Uh, and yeah. that's actually how my my uh, campaign of Masks was working. We had uh, we would only ever play with four players at a time, but there were actually six of us uh, in the the league, the group of uh, of heroes. Uh, but we all started back at our little base every week, so you know whoever was there was the one who went out on the mission. Yeah, and that's exactly why I was able to run AD&D 2nd Edition for 11 years straight in the same campaign world is we played Mercenaries called the Obsidian Fist, and every mission was the, was the start of the A-Team episode, right, where the, where the boss calls in and says, this is what you're doing this week. You're going to raid the goblins. You're going to do this, and it was very clear-cut, and it didn't matter who was there. That that was the team that was chosen to sent that week, and I, it probably would have worked with paranoia, but it was always, you know, the boss chose you for a reason. Yep. But we're a terrible team. But no, you were chosen for a reason to work together, whatever that may be, in fathomable, yeah, metagame. We didn't know who was going to show up. Yep. And they say, if finally, if we tackle a game that doesn't favor episodic play, we remove long distance travel as a common trophy section. It's easier to gloss over a member of your Shadowrunner crew being busy elsewhere in the city for an afternoon than it is to explain a way, uh, a way a missing travel companion on a quest to Mount Doom. And this is sure. a big thing. You know, if you're if you are traveling across the country with your party to, you know, right the wrongs in a different part of the world, it's a lot harder to explain away, you know, Bob going yeah. missing for a week. Whereas That's where you got to do the, the fade to black. The, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Bob was there. Of course, he was just <laughs> taking care of Bill the Pony. He was he he stepped into that cave over there and, and he he's gonna catch up to us later. Um but no, it's definitely easier if you're if you know if you're sitting in if you're in a constrained world mm -hmm. rather than you know full universe sandbox traveling. I, I think one of the important things to realize, especially in role-playing games nowadays, is for similitude doesn't matter. Like that that simulationist aspect doesn't matter. It's all about telling an engaging story and having fun, right? Role that, master that's something that modern disagree. games have taught. Huh? <laughs> role master people will disagree with you. Too. Not even then, yeah. like like role master still has magic, right? Like like you can't. I don't know. I, <laughs> I, I that's a, a different topic. To be honest, it's a different topic. So what if Jeff's character is not there this week? Who cares? Just ignore the fact Jeff's character is not there. You don't need an excuse. For Jeff's character to not be there. <laughs> if you really want one, sure, but you don't need it. It's not important. It's not going to break anything. Yep. All right. Well, now All right, that we're done with our thoughts on the main topic, let's head over to the lobby and see what they think. Uh, Jeff Seuss was saying, uh, in a Delta Green campaign, when the GM was away for one session, they ran out a session of Inspectors, a 90s paranormal investigation yep. TV show RPG. Yeah, the Ghostbusters RPG. That's basically what that one is. I, I've actually been tempted to pick that up because one of my grail games is Ghostbusters from West End Games from years and years ago. So I've heard Inspectors is a good replacement, though I still kind of want that original game with the ghost eye. Red Reaper Ryan's mentioning Stefan Feld is apparently a Rollmaster fan. Yeah, I was the one that shared that yep. today. <laughs> heard an interview with him on the um, Rolling Dice and Taking Name podcast. Stefan Feld went to Gen Con for the first time ever. Man, is that ever a soft-spoken, very friendly-sounding gentleman. Like, just... and pl Plus, one that makes me cry, because yet again, people talk about not being able to make it in the industry. Stefan Feld has a full-time job, and that's just wrong. Stefan Feld should not need a full-time job for the amount of games he has and has published. And Oh, it drives me nuts. The... the Content creators like him can't just be content creators at, at that level. That blew me away. But yeah, he's a huge RPG fan, um, played something else, but he's like, yeah, he was a huge fan of Rollmaster, which, you know, guy, it kind of fits. <laughs> if, if you want a point salad role-playing game, yep. yeah, that, that's Rollmaster's about as good as you're going to get. The other dr news that he dropped is he's got no games coming out this year, but in 2021, he will be releasing his first miniature game. Ooh. So that'll be interesting to see. And I know this is not news for anyone who's actually up to snuff on their podcast, but I'm still <laughs> way behind and I'm just getting Gen Con news now. So yeah, I'm catching up. I'm yep. getting there. <laughs> All right. So uh, anyone else have any thoughts on what to do when someone has to cancel? Uh, what do your groups have social contracts? 
Uh, yeah, so uh, Ryan notes, stop creating RPG campaigns that are more fun than the ones you're already playing. Yeah, that was a problem. <laughs> yeah. Like, Leanna hates me for it. She's like, there's so many, like, uh, which I forget which, awarded campaigns that, like, could have been great that we moved away from. Yep. I said, I don't get it. Like, I, I, why some of this stuff just seems so obvious now, right? That, that just we never thought to sit around and go, wait, are you all having fun? <laughs> like, like you have the cues, right? You're like, oh, obviously that player's not having much fun and I need to run the game different. Like, why why didn't I ask? Yeah. Like, are you not digging this? Oh, it just ends up that they got a math test on the weekend and they think they might have failed and they're stressed about their marks, right? Oh, they they're loving the game, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, we we did do some feedback. Like you'd be like, hey, is everyone having fun? Yeah, yeah, it's great. But like it's just we it's that having that adult conversation, why is that so hard? Yeah. For people in general about all topics. Well, and we had issues with with problem players. That we yep. should have been open and discussed we, we, yes, instead definitely. of instead of discussing behind people's backs. Uh, you yeah, know, we, we, were... we did the whole, oh, no, no, we play on Tuesdays now. And let's not tell that guy over there that we now play on Tuesdays. Yeah. Or no, we ended that campaign. All, all the bad. Yeah, no, we were that... we were immature kids that didn't know any better at the time. And hopefully we're able to pass on some of what we've learned from making those mistakes. Yes. And you won't have to. I, I hopefully we're, and we still get better. I'm still yep. we're still we're no we're near perfect. That's for sure. Nope. <laughs> um, what was it? I saw Fifty First State. I haven't played that. Uh, Red Meeple Ryan's was curious about it. Fifty First State. I haven't played that, but I played um, Imperial Settlers, which is the fantasy retheme of it, and it was a fantastic game. Uh, Fifty First State. It's more of a post-apocalyptic theme, and for some reason, it didn't sell well. Once he made it about farming, it started selling better. Now both have been re-implemented in. Oh, first something, first settlers. I'm drawing a blank right now. Ah, we're in the lobby. I'm going to look it up. Is it first settlers? It just came out. No, it's not first settlers. Dang. I, I am drawing. I don't draw blank on <laughs> games very often. That's that's a rare one for me. Yeah, I can't. can't uh... Uh, Canada Mirror, the first settlers is from 2004. So. Oh, that one I played. <laughs> I, I own that. First Martian? Is no, no, that supposedly is terrible. Uh, Imperial Settlers is the original. What the hell is the new one? Oh, it's driving me nuts. Imperial Settlers. Wow, that ran a lot of awards. <laughs> Uh, Imperial Settlers, Imperial Settlers of the North. Empires. Imperial Empires Settlers of the, of the North, North is the new is this year's. Empires of the North. That's Empires the one North. that redoes Imperial Settlers. Okay. So it even has Imperial Settlers in the name. But yeah, Emp Empires of the North is supposed to be the new re-implementation of it that does a really good job of it. I really like Imperial Settlers. It's it's one of the best games I've played. Yeah, Imperial Settlers Empires of the North has got uh seven seven yeah. with uh with over a thousand ratings. So that's looking... Yeah, like I said it looks really good. Uh, yeah, if you're more into the 51st state theme, like I said, the basic thing, it's all about putting cards on one side or the other side of um, your player board and attacking other players' buildings and stuff. It, it's solid. I, it's been too long since I played it to be able to do it justice to really describe how to play, so I'm not going to try. But I do enjoy it. I put it this way. I own it. I still own it. I bought a box insert for it, which is why I haven't played it, because I don't <laughs> play anything I buy box inserts for. Because that's that's why I haven't built the Imperial Settlers box insert Sean gave me, because once I do, I'll, I'll never play. Not Imperial Assault. Okay. Um, the game we're talking about later today, Eminent Domain. Because once I build that and put that in the box, there's no way I'll never play. Well, you've got to play it a couple of times for the review. So <laughs> I know I got I got to play the the Exotica exp expansion. So that's why I better not. Yep. Once I play Exotica, then I can build it. All right. Well, we'll be check back checking in with the lobby a couple more times during the show. Just remember, if you've got a question for us, head over to the website and click on Ask the Bellhop, or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com.